Hello, this is Dr. Jack Myers. Welcome to Jack Myers Ministries and Life Family Church Podcast Channel. Be blessed by this message. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the seven wisdom principles to live by. Seven wisdom principles to live by. Go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. It's very powerful. Seven principles of wisdom to live by. It is important more than anything that you have no time to waste when it comes to making right decisions. You have to make right decisions, and you cannot make right decisions without consulting the Lord and those in leadership. It's important. I'm just telling you. Because there are the time is going by so quickly that people that make decisions, it may they may not even recover from the decision, especially if it was a bad decision. Things are just moving so quickly. Proverbs 4, 7 says this, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Principle number one. When the question arises about making a life-altering decision, make sure you give the right answer. When the question arises about making a life-altering decision, make sure you give the right answer. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, O Lord, I know that the determination of the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh Lord, I know that the determination of the way of man is not in himself. It is not in a man to direct his own steps. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps and makes them sure. Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil to give you an expected end. So when you question, when a question arises about making a life-altering decision, make sure you give the right answer. You have to understand, you, there's a, never a decision that anybody makes that does not affect the lives of others. And you have to count the cost. You have to count the cost because it affects so many people. If everybody is saying to you, you shouldn't do it, and you're the only one who says, I should, I think I would reconsider I have nine board members. When we planted the church back in 2010, two years earlier, I, we were going to plant the church because I felt in my heart to plant a base. So I went to our board members, and I have nine board members. And I went to them at a board meeting, and I said, we feel that we're called to pastor and plant a work. What do you say? So all of them, all nine board members said, we don't think that you couldn't do it, but we want you to wait two years. They all said that. You know how many years we waited? Three. Yeah, it was three years. We waited three years. When we, when we came to Plant City, I called my pastor on the phone. I said, we feel like we're going to plant a church in Plant City. I said, well, I know we're only like 20 minutes away from you, 30 minutes away. I said, pastor, if you say to me, now I don't do it, then I won't do it. I'll go somewhere else. Plus, Within a, we're, we're about, a, about at least 40 minutes from every church that we've ever preached in Florida. So we're that far away. Not only that, there wasn't a Rhema Bible church in Plant City. There's one in Brandon, one in Lakeland. But there's not a Rhema Bible church in Plant City. So I considered all of that. That's integrity. That's a character. Why? Because there's never a decision that anybody makes that doesn't affect the lives of others. I'll say it again. If my pastor said to me, don't do it, I would not have done it. As long as it's not immoral, unethical, illegal. Why? Because I'm submitted to authority. I have people in authority in my life. Come on, hello, somebody. I'm submitted to Rhema. I'm ordained with Rhema, licensed with Rhema. You're not, you're not shouting me down. I mean, this is good word. I'm telling you, keep, this is, keeps you safe. Right. Keeps you in the will of God, in the perfect will of God. When a question arises about making a life-altering decision, make sure you give the right answer. Number two, how do you know you're in faith about a situation? You will always have joy and peace regardless of what it looks like. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may be abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We do not make emotional decisions. Emotions are wonderful to feel by, but they're horrible to live by. We don't make emotional decisions. 
you can be moved by holy emotions, which is by the Holy Ghost, by getting the joy or whatever, or God's presence, weeping and things, but we're not making emotional decisions. So number two, how do you know if you're, faith, when you're in faith about a situation, you will have joy and peace regardless of what it looks like? Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What is faith? Faith is believing in a God you cannot see. Trust is letting God lead you into the unknown. Peace is knowing with God all will be well. So you cannot make emotional decisions. Why? Wow, because there's never a decision that anybody makes that does not affect the lives of others. And a lot of people make decisions without considering the effect that it will make upon others. So it's important. So number two, how do you know if you're in faith about a situation? You will have joy and peace regardless of what it looks like. And God, when God tells you to do something, when it gets hard, he hasn't changed his mind. You can be moved by circumstances and going, oh, there's such a great need. And then you can say, well, God told me. And I have a sermon called God Told Me. A lot of people like to use that. Well, God told me. God told me. Well, then it gets really, really hard and it gets really, really tough. And then suddenly God's changed his mind. No, he doesn't do that, regardless of how tough it gets. He actually says you'll have trials and tribulations. When you feel alone, are you sure that you're sure? Why? Because a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. And we do not want to be double-minded. So I, I very rarely ever say, God told me. How many times have you ever heard that out of my mouth? I don't say, I, you don't say, you don't, uh. I'm very careful. Because if God told me, then he told me. And if he told me, he's letting me know ahead of time of what I'm going to have to face in the future so that I can gird myself up in faith in the word of God, praying in the Holy Ghost and putting God's word in my heart when the, tough, when the struggle comes, that I, that I won't bail. Hello. Amen. All right. Number three, you may find a small measure of God's power and a small measure of God's blessing when you have made a small measure of personal sacrifice. You may find a small measure of God's power and a small measure of God's blessing when you've made a small measure of personal sacrifice. But to experience God's great power and blessing, you must present your life to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So number three, you may find a small measure of God's power and a small measure of God's blessing when you've made a small measure of a personal sacrifice. You have to understand you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And God has placed people in your lives to be a blessing to you, and Satan has placed people in your lives to be a curse to you. You have to determine who's from who. You got to determine who's from who. Make sure that you make decisions from your spirit, man, not out of your head. It's from your spirit. It's your spirit, man. It's not out of your head. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So in other words, if you, if you want great power in your life, you have to do personal examination. You got to do personal examination. And that's a hard thing to do. So, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, let a man examine himself. Let a man examine himself. When you make personal examination and God reveals to you things that you need to change in your life, it could be very sobering. It's very sobering. But change is a positive thing. It doesn't mean that you have to arrive. God will use you because your heart's right. If your heart is open to change, if your heart is open to correction, if your heart is open to what God wants to put in on the inside of you, then you'll go further. But if you're stubborn and you rebel, I mean, golly, has that worked for me? I mean, I'm rebellious. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And John 3, 26 through 30 says this, And they came unto John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with us beyond the Jordan to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized that all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. 
he that hath the bride has the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy therefore fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. The hardest death you'll ever die is to yourself. Amen. You find yourself apologizing a lot. Come on. That's the hardest death you'll ever die is to yourself. The church as a whole is not ready for what God wants to do. But it's not going to stop God from doing it. The church has either got to get caught up, which I pray, or they'll fall out. It's just the time that we're living in. The upheaval in the earth. The American church is not ready. If you were in the meeting Sunday, <laughs> Saturday night at the crusade, a bomb went off. Chairs were flying everywhere. It was something. People coming up on the stage, falling on the ground, screaming. It was powerful. It's very impactful. You don't, you can, I can tell you, but unless you're there, seeing. When there's a government official on the platform and the Holy Ghost bomb goes on the platform and he goes, I got to get off the stage. I have no idea what's going on here. You know something's happening. It's like a bomb went off. And you stand in awe of what God is doing. And you watch the moving of the Holy Ghost. When you're in a town of 40,000 people and there's only 15 churches. And out of the 15 churches, there's less than 30 people per church. The miracles were so numerous you could not count them. Am I exaggerating, Rock? So many miracles. So many signs and wonders. Demons manifesting while you're preaching. The trip home on Monday and, and Tuesday. You begin to ponder and think. And I thought, the American church is not ready for something that happened like it was in the Dominican. They're, they, they, don't, they have no clue. They have no clue. Not you guys, because we tell you. But I'm talking about the American church as a whole. Have, they have no clue. None. They're too busy with their fog machines and stage lights and cappuccino bars in the foyer. The prophecies of old are coming to pass. And the prophecies, even with Smith Wigglesworth, talks about, it, it, even Brother Hagen, the move of God will astound, astound mankind, astound, shock. When, when you are a Holy Ghost person and you've seen a lot and then you get shocked, if it shocks me, it's got a shock. Awesome. And then you're thinking, how can I see more? What can I do to see more? I mean, the pastor didn't even know. They were shocked. Number four, patience is the great teacher of testing of what you believe while you go through trials, tribulations, and persecutions. Patience is the great teacher of testing of what you believe while you go through trials, tribulations, persecution. Let me say that again. Patience is the great teacher of testing what you believe while you go through trials, tribulations, and persecution. As you pass your test, it will qualify you for a promotion. And your promotion qualifies you for a reward. If you don't pass the test, you will have to take the test over. So let's get it right the first time. How do you know if you pass the test? The reward will be there. God will test your faith, but he won't tempt you with evil. Amen. Patience is the great teacher of testing of what you believe while you go through trials and tribulations and persecutions. As you pass the test, you will qualify you for a promotion, and your promotion qualifies you for a reward. 
If you don't pass the test, you'll have to take the test over. So let's get it right the first time. How do you know if you pass the test? The reward will be there. God will test your faith, but he won't tempt you from you. That's the reason why sometimes it get, when you're in the perfect will of God, that's when the greatest trial, the greatest tribulation, what we call maybe the opposition or the attack of the enemy seems to be the greatest. And if you pass the test, it qualifies you for reward. So how do you know? How do you know if you pass the test? The reward will be there. <clears throat> Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. So in other words, your love walk will be tested. Your patient walk will be tested. These things, these trials and tribulations. The desire to work for the Lord has to be less than the desire to work with the Lord. You have, you have to work with the Lord. Don't, don't jump out ahead of God. Brother Hagin said this, it would be better to be a little slower, a little bit behind God, because you can catch up if you need to. But if you're out there in front of God, timing is the issue for everything. Not everything that's in your heart is for the time you're living in now. There's still millennial reign to come. Not everything that's in your heart right now. It's for right now. God just gives you little glimpses of the future so that you can not make it come to pass. Let him make it come to pass. That's, that's the hardest thing for people, people that are called to preach and called to be preachers. They want to make it happen, make it come to pass. Who can, who can I get around to make my ministry come to pass? I'm not, I'm, I, I learned, take one who used to do that. I used to, in my early years, if I could just get around this person, I get around that person, then they'll open the door for me. They'll see how wonderful my ministry is. Are you kidding me? They're just too concerned about their own ministry. They're not interested in opening up doors for you. <laughs> Amen. They're not interested. They're not. I mean, that's a hard lesson to learn because you can get your eyes off of God and get your eyes on the man. And that's a very dangerous thing to get your eyes off of God and on the man. Keep it on God. Listen, there's, there's nobody can, that's going to stop whatever God's called you to do. There's nobody going to stop. But if the majority of the people that are in your life that you, you, you say may be in leadership with you or over you, and they say need to hold and put on the brakes, then maybe you might need to put on the brakes as long as it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical. Amen. Put on the brakes. Amen. Come on. Put on the brakes. There's nobody's going to stop the call of God on your life. Amen. Nobody. And I'm not interested. But I am interested in people being sober-minded and not emotional-driven. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a Facebook way. Be sober-minded, not emotional-driven. Some of you need to that on Facebook since I'm not on it anymore. Sober-minded. Be sober-minded, not emotional-driven. Ephesians 5, 9 and 10 says that the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth, Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So patience is the great teacher of testing what you believe. Just because you're facing a hardship in your life doesn't necessarily mean that God is not allowing you to go through it because he's going to allow you to go through it so that the testing of your faith, testing of what you believe, may produce patience because God's got to work with people. And that's where you got to be patient. You know, it's... it's God will put you with the right people at the right time to help you in your life. Amen. And, and, you're, and you may not like that person. God is like that. He'll stick you with the person that you don't like so that you can eventually like them. And if you don't like them, then he'll stick your mansions together in heaven for eternity. I mean, you go, and you'll have to wake up every single morning. My God, my God, that person that tested me every single day. You get to see your smiling face as they look through their window and tulips at you. Praise God. <laughs> Number five. It is a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it, then later hates you and talks bad about you behind your back. But rebuke a wise man and he will become wiser still and he will love you for it and then therefore grows by. Number five. It is a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it, 
then later hates you and talks bad about you behind your back. But rebuke a wise man and he will become wiser still and love you for it, then grows thereby. Proverbs 9, 8, reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Woo! Proverbs 9, 8, rebuke not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto the course is wise. So number five, it is a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it. Hey, Brother Jack. Hey, Pastor Allen. Brother Jack says I'm his pastor, but I only see him once a year at the meeting. Welcome to the once a, meeting, once a year meeting, Brother Jack. I love you, Pastor. Rebuke me some more, please. Appreciate you. Amen. I don't want to be called a fool because I reject rebukes from my pastor or anyone else that I consider to be leadership in my life. Keeps me safe. Keeps me safe. I like to be safe. I don't know what I don't know. Number six. Carrying the cares of this life is pride in the eyes of God. For he said, cast your cares on him. So when you pick up the cares of life, you are saying you can fix it better than God can. That's prideful. Humility and fear of the Lord will bring wealth, honor, and long life. Number six, carrying the cares of this life is pride in the eyes of God. For he said, cast your cares on him. So when you pick up the cares of life, you are saying that you can fix things better than God. That's prideful. Humility and fear of the Lord will bring you wealth, honor, and a long life. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So if if you're carrying the cares of life, you're carrying them, that's pride. Because he said, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. So if you're carrying the cares of this life, then that's pride. And pride comes before a fall. So in other words, what does that look like? When pride is there and you think that you can fix your financial problem or you can fix your relationship problem or you can fix your family problem or you can fix whatever problem more than God can. It's very prideful. And the Bible says, Pride comes before a fall. So in other words, falling or failing in your finances, in your relationships, in whatever it is going, whatever's going on in your life, you start to fail. You start to fall. First Peter 5, 6 and 7, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in time, in due time. When's due time? When you don't give a rip. Praise God, amen, that's due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride comes before a fall. Pride comes from falling short in circumstances. Pride comes, then a falling short happens. We will fall short in hearing God's voice. We will fall short in the blessings of heaven. We will fall short. Carrying the cares of this life is pride in the eyes of God. For he said, cast your cares on him. So when you pick up the cares of life, you are saying that you can fix things better than God. That's prideful. Humility and the fear of the Lord are bring wealth, honor, and long life. You have to, to be able to hear the voice of God for your life and for what's to come, you have to walk in humility. Humility is your protection from deception. And you can see that the world is very deceived. And many people in the body of Christ are very deceived. They're deceived. Why? Because the God of this world blinds the eyes. Blinds, it can blind the eyes of believers as well as unbelievers. Cannot see what you cannot see. The only way to see is get the light in thee. It's a stubborn person who does not listen. And then either blames the devil or blames God when they don't, what they need to do is blame the decision that they made because they acted in pride and not humility. Humility is your protection from deception. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will exalt you. 
None of us know it all. None of us know it all. We can all fall into these things. But God said that he will, through the Holy Ghost, show you things to come. You just, you just want to be steady. You do not want to be tossed to and fro like a ship on the ocean. You don't want to be tossed to and fro. Steady as she goes. Even though the wind is blowing, the rain is falling, the waves are crashing, it's just steady. You stay steady. Keep on keeping on. Because there's no one that's going to stop the plan of God for your life. Nobody. Sometimes you have to give God opportunity to work because you're dealing with other people. And God's got to work around that. But you just stay steady. You keep your declaration. You keep the word in your heart. You know that you know that you know. And then you allow him to bring it to pass in your life. Because he'll bring it to pass. Some, like I said, some things are during the millennial reign. They just are, because it's one life. It's one life you're living. So just stay steady. Matter of fact, forget about it. <laughs> Throw everything on the shelf. Then you, then you can be at peace, because you're not forcing anything. You're not pushing anything. You're not shoving anything. Number seven. A life without a harvest is proof that we've invested in the wrong people or wrong organizations. What are we talking about? The seven principles of wisdom. Number seven, a life without a harvest is proof that we have invested in the wrong people or wrong organizations. We have sown into people and organizations thinking that our seed would bring us a harvest. Seed does not change the soil, it just only reveals it. How can you tell if it's the right people or organizations? The ones, those ones will bear fruit and their fruit remains. You'll know it by the fruit. If you're making investments into people, you know it by fruit. A life without a harvest is proof that we've invested in the wrong people or wrong organizations. There are people that are just takers. The leech says, give, give. The leech Anybody know any leeches in your life or past life? <laughs> that all they do is just take, 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 and they never give anything? Seed does not change the soil. It only reveals it. Plant something in somebody's life and see what happens. Give something to someone and see what happens. Seed does not change the soil, it just reveals it. How can you tell if it's the right people or right organization, the one that bear fruit and their fruit remains? First Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 says, <clears throat> And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in the love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. First Thessalonians 5.12, as we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Do you have people in your life that love you, care about you, and are over you in the Lord? The Bible says to admonish them. Am I reading it right? First Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Admonish you and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Matthew 7, 16 through 20. You shall know, know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns and figs and thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So you have to, you have to see what's in their life. Pastor Rodney, my pastor, he's a good, that's good ground. Huge fruit in his life, in him and Adonica. And I've received a huge harvest for my investment in them. Rhema is a good soil. Amen. And I have invested in Rhema, in the Hagans. Come on. Amen. Craig and Harvest is wonderful. And the board members and the people that we bring here to minister to you when we're not here. We trust them. 
that they'll bring forth the word. And they flow in this. Have you noticed they flow in the supernatural? I mean, all of them do, you know. That's what we want. I, I'm not saying anybody else shouldn't, but just I'm, we want an impartation Amen. in people's lives because we're, we're stewards. So, number one, when the question arises about making a life-altering decision, make sure you give the right answer. Number two, how do you know if you're, fa- you're in faith about your situation? You will have peace and joy regardless of what it looks like. Number three, you may find a small measure of God's power and a small measure of God's blessing when you've made a small measure of personal sacrifice. That's a hard word for the body of Christ, personal sacrifice. Personal sacrifice. Because most people are out for themselves. A lot of people don't believe the preacher. And he's preaching the word, so therefore they really don't believe the word. But don't believe the word. Put God's word in your heart and believe it. So how do you know if you're in faith of a situation? You'll have peace and joy regardless of what it looks like. Regardless of what it looks like, you have peace and joy regardless of what it looks like. It's a hard situation. Do you have peace and joy? Yes. Do you have peace? No joy. No, then it's not. Do you have joy? No peace? No, you have to have peace and joy. Peace and joy regardless of what it looks like. Number three, you may find a small measure of God's power and a small measure of God's blessing when you have made a small measure of personal sacrifice. But to experience God's great power and blessing, you must present your life to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. You have to understand that you have to prepare yourself for the future of what God has for you. Preparation time is never wasted time. Better to prepare now for a greater future. And if God's called you to something, he's not going to change his mind. Especially if it gets really, really hard. I sure hope I'm helping some people. Number four, patience is the great teacher of testing of what you believe. It's your belief system. You believe that God wants you to prosper. There's going to be a test. Does God want you to be in ministry? There's going to be a test. Whatever it is, there's going to be a test. You're going to be tested. Stop blaming the devil. He's under your feet. He's been defeated. Patience is the great teacher of testing of what you believe, why you go through trials, tribulations, and persecutions. You're going to go through them. Don't be depressed while you're going through a trial, tribulation, or persecution. Don't be downtrodden. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. So when the airlines shut down because of Debbie, and you don't know what to do, and you can go to the desk and you try to rebook and they won't rebook you and then you drop your bags off and you don't get your bags for three days and then you got to rent two SUVs to drive your team home and you get home at 12 or 1 in the morning don't complain you don't murmur you don't you just we can't change it anyway So you have a choice to make. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Patience is the great teacher of testing. What you believe while you go through trials and tribulations. As you pass the test, you qualify for a promotion. And your promotion qualifies you for reward. If you don't pass the test, you'll have to take it over and over and over. So that... So let's all get it right the first time. How do you know if you pass the test? The reward will be there. Number five, it is a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it. It's a fool. It's a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it, then later hates you and talks about you behind your back. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's so true. It is a fool who rejects a rebuke and debates you over it, then later hates you and talks bad about you behind your back. But rebuke a wise man, and he will become wiser still and love you for it, and then grows thereby. Proverbs 9, 8. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Number six. Carrying the cares of this life is pride in the eyes of God. For he said, cast your cares on him. So when you pick up the cares of life, you are saying that you can fix things better than God can. 
That's prideful. Humility and the fear of the Lord will bring you wealth, honor, and a long life. And number seven. A life without a harvest is proof that you've invested in the wrong people or organizations. We have, so, we have sown into people and organizations thinking that our seed would bring us a harvest. Seed does not change the soil, it only reveals it. How can you tell if, if it's the right people or organizations, the ones that bear fruit and their fruit remains? It's important. Seven wisdom principles to live by. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about the ministry and get additional resources, you can visit us at jackmyersministries.com and lifefamilychurch.net.